Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm the Boomer Nerd, known as George Tasca, and today I'm going to start considering what I'm going to do as a new venture. Just recently, I had to toss in my other job for reasons that people would consider most likely. That's probably what it is. Now, given I'm over 60 years of age, I've had a lot of life experience, so I'm asking myself the question, what in my life can I do which is going to be of most help to the community at large? And I have considered a number of things given my life experience. So amongst other things, I have been involved in teaching, been involved in transport, been involved in IT as a software developer, alright so I'll just uh, put those things up just so you can have a quick look and see what I'm up to. So there you go. Start a new venture, been in teaching, transport, software developer. So now I'm considering what else I can be doing. Okay. One of the things I've considered doing is uh, going back into a certain amount of software development, I'm not sure how much, and possibly some kind of education based upon my software experience. Now, it might be, I'm going to drop this down here for now, so you can see what thought processes are going through my head. One of the things I'm thinking I might do, oh yeah, grab hold of this and put it down onto the next title screen. And I can pick this up later on and consider what I'm going to do with it afterwards. Okay. Now, the last time I actually cut a line of code was around about 18 years ago. And I essentially got sick of that. In fact, I lost my complete spirit in the darn thing for a while. Um, the biggest problem I had was that I suppose you could call it a midlife crisis or something like that. Sitting in an office that had no windows and going in there cutting code eight hours a day. I never lost my interest in IT in general but around about that time people started pushing code cutting out of Australia and over into India. Obviously they felt that the amount of money that they were putting out into software development would be a whole lot cheaper if it was sent off to India. Now I don't know if they've still got that attitude or not the last time I spoke to someone in the IT industry they basically said that IT professionals are not valued here in Australia so I suppose the best thing I can do is get out and start doing my own thing so I thought well what better way can I get into back into software than to share my my attempts for those who are interested. One of the things that I'm currently looking at is 
considering the questions because it's been 18 years and the questions that I might have to consider are what changes have occurred in software development since uh, 2003 which language okay so we'll say which programming language is the most popular and yeah uh, and another item is which uh, which field of socket uh, which um, software is most scarce okay all right so with some of those questions in mind we can probably go off and take a bit of a look I'm going to bring up the software sorry the browser that I prefer to use I prefer using this particular browser and so I'm going to put in um, some questions I'm of the attitude that as far as software development is concerned there has been very little change in actual uh, methodologies one of the things that came to my notice as we were heading in towards um, as we're heading in towards uh, 2003 was that the internet was coming on strong smartphones did not exist at that time I think that the first Apple iPhone was still yet to come out but it became very clear to me that the future involves some sort of interface between a browser and an inter and the internet that we would be doing most of our interfacing on a local device and at that time I saw that as being the desktop computer because that pretty much still was king as far as uh, computer interfaces were concerned but uh, it was going to be um, some interaction between a browser uh, window and that a lot of the grunt work would be done in the background across the internet on some kind of data server and the a lot of the companies at that time were not really friendly to the idea of using a consistent software interface for their efforts <coughs> uh, XML was coming out and that was starting to become popular uh, there was HTML which was a subset of XML um, now for those who are wondering uh, we should um, yeah, we'll just see if we can do something here so XML XML now I forget what, exactly what XML stood for so I'll just look that up um, Acronym X 
XML mean. So we'll see if we can find that out. Extensible markup language. So, uh, as it says here, it's simply a way of codifying a, sense, a set of rules for documents that are both human readable and machine readable. The first one came out in 1998. I became aware of HTML in 1994. So obviously XML itself was deemed to be necessary given that HTML as it existed at the time was only really useful for browsers and they wanted something that would be generically useful. For example, what if you wanted to have music? So we've got music markup language. Okay, so there it is, music markup language. And well, it says here that, well, it says MML. Some people say MXL. There is a particular um, bit of software on here. I'm trying to remember what it was called now. Ah, yes, Muse School. Now, just have a quick look here. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to create any new school. Um, so we'll do a save as and so you've got a Muse School 3 file, uncompress Muse School 3 file. Okay, let's uh, kill that off. That's not giving me the answer I want. So let's see. I will try import. Um, okay, export. That'll probably do it. So you can export to uh, PDF file, image file, music XML. That's what it is. Then uncompressed Muse score, MSCX. Music XML has become quite popular. And so it XML is used in this case. Let's go and look that term up. Music XML. And there it is. Music XML is a standard open format for exchanging digital sheet music it allows you to collaborate with musicians using different music applications. So I like to use MuseScore because it's largely free. They get their money by setting up a database. MuseScore. There we go. We'll just go straight to that one. It says dashboard. I don't particularly want to be on the dashboard, so we'll go take a look at it. Okay, so it wants me to log in. So it's been a while since I've been there. Hmm, why dashboard? Ah, I think I'm in the wrong website. Let's try not dot com dot org I think it is. We'll see if that gives us uh, here we go. So we'll try this one. Okay so it's let me in. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Looks like I better go and take a look and see what's going on. Um. Huh. 
Uh, must be dot com. Well, there we go. All right, let's go back there. Ah, browse. Let's try browse. Ah, here we go. That's yeah, more like it. So all of these, if you take a look at this, um, oh, well, let's take a quick look at this one and see what it can do. Okay. So if I click on this, you'll notice it has MuseScore, PDF, Music XML, has MIDI, and audio. So we don't know what software this particular person used. He probably used MuseScore because given it's a MuseScore site, we we'll assume that these people who wrote this music put it up in here. But Music XML allows me to change it over and then it can be used in any other software that can read Music XML. So it's something that's be nice to see, say, uh, LMMS. Uh, let's look that up. Linux. Uh, it's a lin bit of Linux software that can take various sounds and do all sorts of wonderful things to them. So we'll just take a quick look here. Okay. It's the right. So here you go. So I don't know when the last when the last update was done. So Linux show release notes. So the last change was made in 2020. So just over a year ago. So it's fixed up a whole stack of bug fixes. Now, what's the nightly version? 2021, April. So, one of the questions we want to ask is, is this software going to have support for music XML? It may do eventually. Can't see. Okay new features okay we've got a blowy in the house gonna have to take care of him just trying to see if there's anything here that implies any support for music XML probably the quickest way to do that is to go up to the top just do a find for music and there isn't okay all right so it doesn't look like there's any mention of music XML. It says get involved. Join development. Written in C++ using the Qt framework. The thing about these, you don't have to take, hesitate to get yourself dirty coding. Okay. So we might have a quick look at that. Um, it's one particular option, but I want to go into it further. I want to go in a little bit more slowly, as it were. So, okay. All right. So one of the questions we've got to ask ourselves is, where do I go from here? Okay. So I'm going to ask some questions here. Changes in software development over 20 years. We'll just put in here last 20 years. And we'll see if we can find any, okay, any documents here that indicate ah uh, yes when I came out there was a thing known as extreme programming and 
it became the Agile Manifesto. So we'll take a quick look at those as well and just see what kind of changes. So we'll take a quick look at some of these and see which ones look like. See, it talks about how to take. Oh, just hold on a moment. Okay, looks like uh, that phone call has come to an end, and so I'm now going to consider some of the questions that were asked before. What changes have occurred in software development since 2003? Well, an article came back out uh, back in 2020. It says six software development trends witnessed by developers. <coughs> okay. Uh, proprietary to open source. Okay, I saw that starting to happen. Uh, around about 1994. It wasn't exactly popular at the time, but it did exist. It was a thing known as open source and the Linux operating system became open source around about the time that uh, Linux got into or Linus Torvalds decided to get into the uh, um, software development system now he made all of his code available And Richard Storman decided to become a an evangelist for open source code. Now, so we'll take a quick look at it. I've got some slides here that are probably probably are worth considering. Okay, so software is no more business commodity from toddlers to your grandparents. Everyone uses software products. Well, okay, I suppose if you want to have your babies babysat by computer programs, yeah, by all means, uh, they will definitely be using them. Although they could be using them in other capacities. There's a lot of software that is put into hardware devices these days. So over 700 programming languages used to deliver the right software. Uh, I think it depends on your mindset as to which one is the best. But also some are very task specific. For example, SQL is very much database specific and it will feed you information depending on the questions you ask of the database. Whereas C++ is more of a generic language, it is used at all levels from operating system machine level all the way up to user interface level. Time required to build and release an application has reduced from a few years to a few months. We were uh, around about, oh, okay, I'm going to have to pause again. Okay. Uh, I first got involved in rapid software development, so-called at the time, because it did speed up the process for quite a lot of things. But even so, with over a hundred thousand lines of code, the there was a lot of functionality to put into the code. For example, I using rapid software development techniques took six weeks to create a specific report development tool that would allow people to do the printing of reports, custom reports. <coughs> Okay, time required to build and release an application is reduced from a few years to a few months. Okay, we've already done that one. Number four, just in 2018, nearly 1,200 new software startups were launched in India. Well, 
there was back in 2003 I saw a move to try and push a lot of software development over into India from Australia and of course I guess the aim was to try and keep the wages down of the software developers because they were generally getting paid reasonable money um, not as but in my my opinion it still wasn't enough world's most valued company Amazon owes 71 percent of its profits to its software business so this article was written in 2020 so six major changes witnessed by software development proprietary to open source software waterfall to agile methodology silos to DevOps philosophy I don't, don't understand that one on-premise to cloud computing don't like cloud computing and I'll explain why eventually isolated models to connected APIs in source to outsourcing okay proprietary open source well I saw a move towards open source in my time and I still think that it is the best way to go uh, for, especially for software that is being distributed to thousands and possibly millions of people it allows people to actually see if there's any possible faults or security holes and these can be removed the general turnaround time for open source software when bugs and security holes come up is much shorter than it is for proprietary from the OS that powers Android phone well that's Android it's an open source software to the framework that controls Facebook appearance a large number of software products are open source actually a lot of software is actually downloaded onto computer for the for the browser itself a lot of the things that we're seeing on here are the result of code so if I were to let's see see if we can view page source so if I view page source this is what I see I see all of the code that controls the things that we get to see as you can see it's essentially a whole load of gobbledygook if I take a look at things like the uh, curly braces uh, took take a look at some of the various other things it looks suspiciously like JavaScript and of course JavaScript is one of the most popular popular uh, types of uh, programming for browser level types of programming now I'm going to blow this one away go back to the actual page itself so you can see the code is downloaded and it is used to buy the browser as an interpreter reads the code and then carries out various instructions according to what the code has to say <coughs> top organizations like Microsoft Google IBM Adobe and more are actively making their inventions open source to boost software development well actually that might be true but there are some what I would call their crown jewels which are not being are not being um, open source for example Microsoft does not open source Windows Adobe does not open source its paint shop and other um, premier um, uh, bits of software which now are being more like uh, offered as subscription models rather than something that you get to own and to some degree um, I can kind of see uh, some logic behind that especially when you are working with such huge apps that, that potentially have so many bugs in them because there will be bugs in the applications you just don't happen to notice them they don't manifest themselves you may not create the right kind of circumstance for it to manifest itself uh, but n nonetheless they keep those things they keep those things uh, closed source 
and they do not want that kind of stuff to get out to the world in general. Okay. But what you can do, and this is what the open source community has done, is they have created parallel products. For example, Microsoft Office, which has since become Microsoft 365, has a competitor that does essentially the same kind of thing. It's called LibreOffice. It is open source and will probably do all the things that about 99% of the population want. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you can choose to go with that one. You might say, okay, no, I don't like it. It's not so good. It user interface is not so posh quite possibly but at the same time it still does what you want if forking out five hundred dollars or more for the Microsoft Office is beyond your capability at one time five hundred dollars for a bit of software was an awful lot of money it was more than a week's pay but it was still $500 back then. It's still $500 now, but the value, obviously, of the $500 is not the same now as it was back then. Okay. So what have we got here? It says waterfall to agile methodology. Okay. Well, The whole idea of the waterfall methodology was you would do the steps one at a time. Concept, design, develop and test. Now they do design, test, develop, design, develop, test. And it keeps going in iterations. Uh, yeah, yeah, but they use what's known as test harness these days. Um, back in the day when I was doing programming, I was using a language that was not quite so well known. And initially, I started using uh, Pascal, and then Ball and Pascal came out with their with their um, language which was really Pascal and then uh, Delphi the rapid application development framework RAD hmm, became popular and that was still Pascal but it had a lot of other features that you could find that you would then subsequently find in other bits of software Okay. Hmm. So, they're trying to say that they're using the Agile methodology. Well, um, there's other aspects to Agile methodology that they're not telling you. For example, uh, in a full on Agile methodology type system, you will have two people one computer so one person will sit down for about half an hour working on the computer the other person will sit over his shoulder watching now the thing that's interesting is that the person watching is always going to see things that the other person will not see I have observed this myself where I was able to stand back and see things that they couldn't see it's a bit annoying because when you're sitting there and you're the one handling the keyboard, you know, things you think that you should be able to see, you don't. And I'm, I'm not sure why that is. Um, it's a bit of a problem. And the problem is resolved by having someone stand over your shoulder and look at you coding. And then after half an hour, you swap positions. The person watching now sits down and hits the code 
and the person uh, the, a person who was coding now sits back and watches the other fella code and apparently this has com been commercially beneficial the amount of code that gets out and the amount of bugs that are in the code that have to be fixed later on well it increases the amount of code and it also increases um, decreases the number of bugs that that uh, that turn up in the code and if bugs do turn up in the code it's probably because one of the tests that were written up to run the um, the uh, the code uh, had not been written to take certain things into account and the best part about the test harness is you rewrite the test so as it will take these other bits into account and it will do some measurement now this is a bit that is confusing me what is the silos to DevOps philosophy the people developing the software and the people managing its operations should work together the result was DevOps okay all right the early concept was to create silos of developers and operations engineers but DevOps has brought seemingly disparate processes of the software together together engineers who code the software work closely with engineers who test it enabling both to contribute to each other ah so we've got testing engineers the devops philosophy has changed the software development industry in several ways devops particularly applies to software development companies that are responsible responsible for creating impactful software devops achieves the following benefits developing and deploying applications faster making applications reliable under varying circumstances enabling applications to perform well for 10 or 10,000 users in other words that would be scalability so in other words it works well for maybe 10 people does it work well for 10,000 that's scalability but then I suppose the converse question could be asked it works well for 10,000 will it work well for 10 the general presumption is yes but is that tested improving security in business domains hmm. okay on-premise to cloud computing okay so this is basically all internet based type stuff cloud computing is the idea is you take your software workloads to virtual servers hosted on the internet or cloud before cloud computing being able to afford internet applications was extremely limited the advent of cloud computing acts as a catalyst for software development as it becomes easier to offer your software to more people at lower costs around the world the business viability of software also gets better today 90 percent of companies around the world host their software on the cloud which includes us cloud computing makes dramatic developments in the infrastructure required to run software online it's simple to prove how beneficial cloud computing is if you want to share 15 gigs of data with your friend in another city you have to buy a flash drive 10 to 20 bucks flash drive and spend money on the travel maybe you could post it where sharing on Google Drive is actually free well that's valid now I'm going to describe my objections to this problem they've given an example where you are able to transmit data and if you have a break in the data it's going to not cause the whole world to come to an end it can just pick up and run as it goes but if you've got cloud computing that is time critical and you have an unreliable communications infrastructure that is going to cause a problem see all of what they're describing here assumes quite a few things it assumes a extremely reliable 
computer system can, it, it assumes it's an extremely reliable telecommunications infrastructure and it assumes an extremely reliable power supply upon which this infrastructure is driven. Anybody who has gone to a third world country will know just how stupid such ideas are. For example, uh, I have uh, lots of contacts in Papua New Guinea and I've had them come down here and visit me and one of the things that they will always comment on is the fact that there's no power blackouts here. Well, the reason is fairly self-evident at the time. People here who experience power blackouts, if they were to con experience on a regular basis, would be running the politicians out on a rail. But up in Papua New Guinea, it is accepted as part of the norm. Um, there's no, there's no real um, drive on the part of the people to run the politicians out on the rail if they don't, if they don't. Um, perform well in terms of supplying electricity. Therefore, you cannot necessarily rely on the electricity to be reliable supply. And you can see that there is a general assumption on the part of businesses within a third world country that there's going to be failure of electricity. And how do you see that? You just go around the premises and somewhere on the premises is going to be a giant electric generator which will be fired up the moment that the blackouts begin. And then of course if uh, telecommunications goes down, which it can do, then your cloud computing app is really of no value. Okay. But the whole thing here is that in, in spite of all of that, if you've got um, ways of sharing information and it's not time critical and it's not uh, and it can and, and it can be resumed in terms of data transmission well then there's probably some worth in having having cloud computing okay os isolated models to connected APIs this term gets thrown around a lot because it's actually that essential in modern software development scene. An API, that is an application programming interface, is a method by which two disparate systems can share data and functionality. APIs are critical in connecting the diverse universe of software products making life easy for integrations. APIs have existed since 2000, but only in the past decade have their true potential realised. Common example is Google Cloud Vision API, which you can enable image intelligence in your software products. You don't have to build the necessary AI algorithms for it. Simply plug into the API, use your own implementation concept of APIs has made the internet a highly connected environment and benefits everyone from the software developer to the end user. Yeah, that's all very well. Uh, but what happens if the company behind which the API is in existence disappears overnight? What are you going to do then? Are there backup companies that are able to take up the load? Maybe, maybe not. 
and I think that uh, we are losing redundancy within the computing community. We do need redundancy because without that, as soon as one, we we then drop our points of failure down. We need to ensure that we don't have a single point of failure when it comes to using various kinds of software. And so for that we need redundancy. We need to make sure that at no stage do we have a single point of failure. For example, if you're driving a car down the road, the single point of failure could be a number of things. It could be that the engine runs out of fuel. Okay, so the engine runs out of fuel. That single point of failure ensures that you now have to come to a stop until you can get some more fuel into the car. That's a single point of failure. One way of getting around that may be to have a dual fuel vehicle. You could have gas and petrol. But you do not want single points of failure in software, especially if the API once disappeared, makes it, it makes it uh, very expensive and time-consuming to produce a substitute, which may be critical to the running of your business. You need to have alternatives that can be thrown into into action immediately. Okay, in-house to outsourcing. The last factor that has changed software development to a great extent is the outsourcing model. This is how top organizations based in America get their software made from engineers sitting in India. Global IT and software outsourcing industries valued at $92.5 billion as of 2019. Well, that's a couple of years back. Enables companies to procure winning software at lower costs which you can read lower wages as it continues to create jobs in the provider countries. This share of human resources across boundaries has actually boosted innovation and unprecedented growth in software development. Software is getting easier to make, smarter to work with and increasingly effective at its job, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, nah, not interested. So there's nothing really here that tells me anything that's going to be helpful in trying to decide how I'm going to attack the business model. It's, it's actually created problems. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in... This is what I call high-level stuff. This is not brass meets the... What do you call it? Tax... Rubber hits the road. Okay, okay. Rubber hits the road. Getting down the brass tacks, all of that kind of thing. Um, I'm wanting something that tells me something more about programming. So, so this doesn't tell me anything about about programming itself. For example, um, when I came into the programming industry, there had been a big change in in uh, programming and the change was that, that the uh, actual way of developing code had developed from um, procedural to um, from procedural to object oriented or class based programming depending on the technology um, that the actual um, language that you use. Okay. All right. So this is talking about Okay, so it's talking about um, agile programming. Um, I'm not really sure 
Yeah, I'm going to look this up. If I think I know what a Scrum Master is, but I'm going to look it up and try and figure it out. Scrum is an agile framework for developing, delivering, staying growth. Scrum Master. Scrum Master facilitates or Scrum. Lightweight, actual focus on time box iterations called sprints. True team leaders. Okay, so they're essentially like a manager. That's what I thought. And when I, as soon as I saw the um, term quite a few years back, oh, maybe about 15 odd years ago, I first saw of it in reference to people who are in, in Europe and it looked like Europe was into the scrum master type of thing more so than it was here in Australia. Australia has been very, well, when I last looked, Australia has been very slow on taking up agile methodologies. Uh, okay. All right, so okay. Daily stand-up handbrakes are used by all my Agile Scrum teams. Okay, what is Agile all about? Yeah. No. Nah. Okay, not interested. Tech technology development over the years. Okay, what are they trying to tell us? This looks like it's a whole bunch of. Says web to PDF. Uh, all right, I'm going to have to go back and try and look for it again. Okay. Don't think I've asked the right question. This is annoying. Let me try something else. Okay. <sighs> well, a couple of articles here that might be a bit more effective. Uh, see these, as soon as you get to this, how technology, blah, 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 not interested. Uh, no, too general. So we'll try some of these. I might also try Google as well and just see whether or not that can help. Then I'll take a look at some of these articles. All right, how programming changed over the last decade, software programming surpassed by industry, but how much has it changed? Hmm. Okay. Is it easier to program? Level of difficulty, if anything new you learn, is dictated by your dedication. Blah. Blah. Fans' career change, there's barrier to entry, encoding. You'll need to know how to code. Yeah, of course. Too many things from the off. If you can't execute, it's that hard to learn. Yeah. Oh, come on, get to the point. Free no. 
theory command language. <coughs> okay, reckon stack overflow. Pack with example code for different functions which you multiply the pit you need. <coughs> Yeah, all right. I'm not a big real re, wheel reinventor, but I can grab something that already exists and modify it. Suit my purpose, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's just a learning thing. In fact, beginner, it's often to reverse useful to reverse engineer testing code to see how it works. Well, the, yeah, you can do that. That that's a teaching experience for yourself, a learning experience. You have to learn to walk before you can run. Use simple languages like HTML, PHP. Yeah. Vocabulary. Okay, the basic logical writing commands to make something happen transferable between them. Oh yeah. Well, I reckon that'll be about right. Just need to learn how to say commands in that particular language. Then go to scrape and get it. Yeah, but come on. I want to know what's different about programming now compared to the old days so you've got delete blah blah and looks like a an array return that comes pops back out of a function okay oh come on give me something freaking useful um followed by the name of Jerry, what's his name? I'll just take a quick look and see what he had to say. Um, Purnell, Jerry Purnell. I wouldn't mind if someone like him was around. He could probably uh, tell us exactly how things have changed. Rovers handled data. Oh, okay. Novice program on automate some okay yeah all right yeah done that. From there you may find start the current database on the MS Access or SQL databases as databases offer much more scope for automation and spreadsheets alone. Yeah all right I can believe that. Once you have a robust handle on database you may wish to place your new document automation system online or gather data from customers via website instead of manually entering them. Not only that, but to come up with more ideas, well, more and more, more functionality is system, and it's called feature creep. Oh, yeah. Best if you've already got a system in production that's earning your bucks before you start adding too many features. So now you can start building an SQL database online and discover you need to mo oh, come on. HTML, PHP. Query insert update. Uh, what did PHP mean? Then oh, I didn't did used to know. Okay, let's look at it. Okay, PHP hypertext. Oh, so it's a, what do you call it? Recursive thing. PHP hypertext preprocessor. General purpose scripting language, especially suited to web development. Okay, so PHP is yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. I've actually played with PHP. It's not bad as far as languages are concerned. Um, all right. Uh, you got then you got other languages like JavaScript, Python. Along the way, now you need CSS to make your website look nice. In no time at all, you suddenly develop working knowledge, perhaps even mastery of HTML, SQL, PHP, JavaScript, Python, CSS. VBA or because you initially want to automate documents through a website. This kind of path is very organic and you will slowly build on your knowledge over time as you hit problems you want to solve. It really will be a running battle of trial and error. Major yeah, come. Oh, it says sticky guns. Okay, how has it changed over the last 10 years? Alright, this is getting more interesting. When was this article published? 2020, so towards the end of last year, nearly 12 months ago. Rapidly, but none less so than the last decade. Well, let me put that to the test. 
Professional coders are managing a lot more code, not only do they have to handle more languages for more platforms than ever, volume is increasing. You better understand what's at stake, quantify how big code is, how big big code is. In other words, measuring megabytes, number of repositories have changed in the past decade, uh, over half, 51% of self-development stakeholders report they have more than 100 times the volume code they had 10 years ago. And the staggering 18% they say they have 500 times more code. Okay. I don't really care. I'm yeah, but the thing is, how much of that code is actually written by the guys themselves? I mean, there's a case to be made for pulling in libraries of code that are written by other people and they let you do stuff that you want to do. Pioneers in code complexity and management. They found those programmers piled of greed. Software has generally gotten bigger, more complex, and much more important in 2010. Mm -hmm. Major heights of the poll include the following pioneers handling much more code than before. Well, yeah. But some of it you don't maintain. Some of it you rely on others to maintain. So if you've got a framework of some kind, you get that in, and then you just simply plug in where the... Uh, where where the uh, run up is into a problem is when you have to when you actually have to maintain that particular framework. But if you rely on others to maintain the framework, the other thing is you have to learn how to use the framework. And usually there's a lot of documentation that tells you how the framework is used. Some of this is worth having because of the time saved in developing it yourself. And this is why open source is good because you can have bits of code that are very useful to you and then you can see a potential that that little chunk of code is going to be useful to other people so you can whack it up onto a website and let other people have at it and they can potentially find it useful for themselves. As we've already highlighted above, some more code around today than 2010, it might not come as a surprise. What does it, is the actual volume of Overall, it's changed. Half responded reported growth more than 100 fold. Some of this can be explained by an increase in complexity as well as the need to serve various platforms. Well, that's true. If you if you're writing for multiple platforms, so you, you have to write for different browsers because the browsers are not. I've got slightly different interfaces, and then you've got to write for those, and that can be a pain different hardware devices. iPhone is a smartphone, but so is an Android phone. But they both run totally different uh, programming languages. And so you'd need to have two people, possibly, an iPhone specialist and an Android specialist, because it's going to be difficult to specialise in, in one of those. So. Many companies are now tech companies. Uh, the last decade, especially those not generally considered real tech companies, one of the increased interesting takeaways from the data is the extent to which companies outside of technology are now more like technology companies. Software development stakeholders couldn't agree more than 91%, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's nothing to do with. Okay. So the only takeaway from this really is that, well, we're handling more code. 100 times as much, 500 times as much. That's the only real takeaway. It doesn't really help me. Damn. This is pissing me off. This computer programming changed in the last decade. All the power, not all the cost. Oh, come on. Solving problems directly has to do with architecture. The new paradigm of programming has been around since about the late 50s. Machine learning, data driven programming. Oh, come on. Sure, pull off from a small city. All right. I think I'm going to put a question up. I'm going to put a question up and I'm going to see what people can say. Coding easier today than it was 30 years ago. How's programming change throughout the advancement of computers? Okay, look, I might pop into those. Someone says to learn the fundamentals of programming. 
how has coding changed? Okay. Your view on computer programming change over the years. Hmm. Okay. So, how's computer programming changed in the last decade? Sixty-eight answers. Okay. Machine learning. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. This is function way the map. Input certain out popped. <sighs> this is the most important. Okay. Different from traditional programming, which is rules based programming. Okay. I'm going to go back up and go through this with a little bit more because this looks like it's going to be. Um, uh, it's going to be. Uh, worth investigating but it's going to take a bit of passing of what he's just read i'll explain the impact of two disruptive concepts that are changing how we program one has to do with solving problems directly other has to do with architecture a new paradigm of programming that has been around since the late 1950s has been taking over the world lately making great things happen machine learning let's call it data driven programming for now <laughs> I've heard about this there's been some very comical things happen especially in social media with some of these bots put out by big tech companies and the trolls get in there and they mess with the bot and by the time they're done they've got this bot being a Nazi holocaust denier and all sorts of other horrible things so they end up having to pull the darn thing while well, deep learning and machine learning in general is a lot more nuanced than this, if I had to formally define machine learning in a short sentence, I would say something on lines like FX. There it is, FX. I'm going to play this up a bit so we can see it a little bit easier. That'll do. Equals Y. Given X and Y, find F. Of course, a lot more variables. You get the idea. So in other words, they're trying to find almost trying to write the make the program write itself by definition a function is any way to map a certain input to a certain output machine learning aims to make the computer come up with a function to create a specific output for a specific input and provide a lot of inputs and outputs so it's a more general solution hence predicts as accurately as possible after deployment the process it comes up with is called a model. The accuracy of the model depends on how much data was provided during training, the phase of making the computer come up with the process and how clean the data was. Data pre-processing is the most important step of machine learning. Of course, it involves a lot, but I'll stop here. This is completely different from traditional programming, which is rules-based. Essentially, traditional programming is fx equals y define y and come up with function and x manually you get a lot more variables in other words you're looking at the desired outcome and you have to feed in x into a specified function again a lot more variables i'm not trying to write a scientific paper enough details let's see what we've been doing using machine le learning Computer vision. We can now identify objects, people, etc. in pictures. Google Photos can identify people in your photos and search for specific people, for example. We can do considerable amount of things with videos. A lot more is being done in the area of computer vision. Speech recognition. You saw this one coming. Google Assistant, Apple Siri and Amazon Alexa can all understand what you're saying quite competently at that. Not with me, it comes up with some rather comical mistakes. And do tasks or come up with things. This is based on machine learning. Medical diagnosis, given medical data, certain machine learning models can predict, say, cancer. This is being worked on through machine learning along with other problems in the medical field. Self driving cars. This is not being completely solved yet. Current level three self-driving is being sold through machine learning and much much more uh, yeah look the self-driving car issue is quite an interesting one people have been able to take self-driving cars and they've been able to uh, 
once they recognize it's a self-driving car they can bring it to a stop and then they can get at whatever is in the car if it's a, let's say it's a delivery vehicle and steal the stuff because it hasn't learned how to identify threats well that might that might come but at the moment second disruptive concept is decentralization it was widely considered unachievable and theoretical until some actor under the alias Satoshi Nakamoto came up with the blockchain making it feasible on devices we use it's not only being used in cryptocurrency but a lot of other things as well Ethereum a company based on decentralization has expanded upon the original blockchain to create what they are now moulding into a general purpose decentralised platform. Traditional network architectures are centralised. They have a server adhering to requests of clients. Okay, so there's essentially been a, a big change in architecture. Trust. One party has all the data and manages everything. This gives total control to said party has complete control over the mechanism okay seems like I've missed something here all oh, right so traditional network architectures are centralized single point of failure actors can carry attacks towards one point okay how we programmed from code base to architecture all right i'm going to stop there and there's obviously going to be a lot more to go but i think that this is probably a pretty good place to stop so what's he doing rickshaw small city we've hardly been in any school shares memes to others on whatsapp yeah YouTube says oh, whatever that means okay all right so they're talking about yeah no that's not really relevant to me I think the first answer was probably most relevant to me and even that wasn't particularly helpful Three chains, open source, use of technologies. Okay, just hold on. Damn, I think I'm going to put my phone in the bedroom, but trouble is I get people that call me that I need to pick up on. That was a spam call. Okay, all right. Um, just having a quick look here just to see what else is relevant. Uh, Holden is still use the language remains the same, but its application. Okay, so this guy is essentially saying that the language is staying the same, but the use of the language has changed. So, in other words, one of the premises I've made is that there has been no significant change in application development since I left the industry there's just been a change in the way in which applications are targeted so like I said when I first started sorry when I left the industry I could see internet browsers being the primary driver behind I didn't see the smartphone because that didn't exist at the time the smartphone has brought in applications that are developed uh, let me think about this that uh, essentially an application interface to a web background um, this is where the browser can be king because a browser can make all the things happen that applications can make happen for example a communications app can be run quite easily in a web browser but a specific communications app that's all it can do and if the wheels fall off the web application then 
then, then you kind of stuff whereas the browser application is going to be able to be updated fairly quickly um, if there's a bug in the system you just fix the bug do a reload on the page and away you go all right just Java and JavaScript pretty popular languages And what they are using language worldwide. Oh, okay. So they're using, they're using, um, using uh, job ads to determine the popularity of various languages. All right. Okay. Competitive coding. Yeah. Right. Performant. What do they mean by that? Just going to take a quick look at that one. What is performing? More performing. Hmm. Okay. Mm. All right. I'm going to stop this video. Too much silence on my part. Yes, this is uh, George Tasker, the boomer nerd.